Agriculture has proven for centuries to be the most resilient sector. Here in Barbados, while agriculture has taken a backseat to several others, most notably tourism over the years, its importance cannot be understated, especially in a time of climate change and food security. On this one-on-one, -on -one, we look at the sector today and where it is heading in the future. Good evening, I'm Lisa Lord, and thank you so much for joining us for One on One. We begin with the unfolding situation concerning the La Soufre volcano in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We've already had several eruptions and the ash from there has already made its way here to Barbados. And it's not just affecting the average Barbadian, but farmers as well. And we got the opportunity to speak to several of them. My name is Deidre and I'm a small farmer. The name of my farm is Tinkerbell Farm. The way how the ash is affecting me. Well, I used to tap my sheep every day. So what I'm doing now is that I'm trying to just monitor my hay that I have and hopefully the hay, the ash will stop because I need to tie back up my sheep because I can't afford buying hay for my sheep and feed. It is going to be very costly for my small business. And I'm just praying that this soon ends. The way how the ash affect me it's like the dust and thing because the rabbits don't deal good with dust. I got to get the vacuum cleaner on mornings and just blow the pens and dust out. So it got me like cleaning every single day and settling on top of the galvanizer. Although I wash it off because in the morning when you get out at four o'clock, you can still actually see it in the air blowing and everything. I can't really cover the rabbit pens because if I cover them, the heat might kill the rabbits to work because they need air too. So, you know, up to the other day, I lost one because of the same dust thing. It was a baby one, about seven weeks, seven weeks old. Yeah, about seven weeks old. So that's basically how it affected me. Besides the dust, sneezing and, you know, coughing from the dust, but really and truly, is the, the dust just on the leaves of the plant. With a good heavy rainfall, uh, all this should get washed to the roots where it can truly benefit the plants, you know, in, in terms of fertilization. The chives, rosemary, as I said, uh, a good wash and all that going to be in the soil of the plants. Just remember to practice the same protocols you do with the COVID and wash everything before you ingest it. I would be so grateful if the heavens was to open and just let the rain fall and wash away this for the, at least a day of rain. I would appreciate that because then I'd be able to tie back up my sheep at least the next day and I can put my pig back outside because my pig is outside and not inside the shed. All these things are basically a uh, setback into me trying to build my small farming business. Now, to get a better understanding about what this ash means for the sector, we are joined by the Chief Agricultural Officer, Ms. Keely Holder. Ms. Holder, thank you so much for joining us via Zoom. Now, you've already gone on record as saying that this is some short-term pain for much longer gain. What do you actually mean by that? Yes, um, in the short term, we are going to feel some pain and we are feeling some pain in the agricultural sector, uh, specifically um, in the crop section. We've seen um, okras turning brown, uh, leafy vegetables have um, been, we've had damage on those. Um, seedlings or young plants um, may have been burned by the ash. Um, and so as a result of that, we are getting some short term pain. Um, certainly also in the livestock sector, we've been very concerned as it relates to the animals and their health. Uh, the ash can get into their eyes and into their um, mucous membranes on their faces. And so we've been encouraging the farmers to uh, wash the faces of the animals and to be mindful of how much ash is blowing into their pens or into their um, areas where they're they're keeping their animals. The other ash, the other aspect that is uh, also causing a problem as it relates to grazing, the ash on the hay or on the uh, pastures can cause a problem for the sheep in particular, uh, cows as well. But because sheep sheep graze uh, pretty low to the ground, they can end up eating the ash. And we have had some reports of some animals dying as a result of it. The other aspect of that is now um, there is a concern about using the existing hay that we have harvested and also what's in the field to be harvested because of the ash on it and, and the impact it can have on the animals. 
Our senior veterinary officer, Dr. Mark Trotman, has been working closely with the farmer organizations to look at solutions in the short term. As it relates to hay, we have been working closely with the farmer organizations as well as it relates to uh, identifying sources of hay for the animals. And together with the Barbados Agricultural Society, we have been uh, creating a list where farmers can call or contact the Barbados Agricultural Society to get information on where are the sources of hay, which um, suppliers still have hay available. Additionally, we have been looking at sourcing hay or forage from overseas in an effort to try and get um, have a, a, an additional supply and ensure that if we are running short for whatever reason, there's more than enough hay available and so the animals would not suffer. So these have been the main issues that we're seeing um, as it relates to the ash fall. However, in the long term, as the ash moves into the soil, is washed into the soil by rainfall or by irrigation, then the, our soils, we're going to benefit from that. Barbadian soils are on a, we, we hear we have a coral limestone rock and our soils are based on that. Well, coral limestone is really calcium carbonate. And this is what we call alkaline. You hear a lot of talk about alkaline water. Well, Barbados naturally has alkaline water. But for plants, plants actually need um, a more acidic type environment um, to be able to take up nutrients efficiently. So when we talk about like a uh, lemon juice uh, would be slightly acidic. So plants need a more slightly acidic environment for their roots to take up the nutrients from the soil. What the ash does, because it's acidifying, um, it has um, I, uh, elements such as sulfur. This would allow the ash to um, mix in with the soil and where the soil is alkaline, it'll actually bring down the pH from such a high pH, which tends to be somewhere between 7.5 to 8.5 and start to bring it down into the range that the plants actually thrive best in, which is 5.8 to 6.5. So while it hasn't been a lot of ash in terms of what the plants actually would need to be able to, to completely change the pH of the soil permanently. It will be a supplement to the soil and we would see improvements in yields and, and improvements in the quality of crops as a result of it. So in a few months to a year's time, we would start to see the benefits redounding to the sector. And, and crises like this always bring the whole question of food security into the picture. And that's also a concern for you at this time. Okay, so let's talk about what food security is. So we're talking about being able to secure our food supply. That's the most basic understanding of it. And of course, we have to look at the context of Barbados. Now, we only have about a quarter of the land in Barbados is now listed as arable. So it means that we have a small amount of, um, of land area to be able to produce all of the needs of the people of Barbados. As it relates to the agricultural supply, um, our food security has to focus more on self-reliance as opposed to self-sufficiency. Not all of the agricultural products that are consumed by Barbadians, we can actually grow here. So we have to focus and we need a three-stage focus for this. We want to um, approach food security, first of all, from self-reliance, growing more of the things that we can grow here given the limited land space and given our tropical environment. We also then want to uh, be able to develop our farmers and our agribusiness entrepreneurs to the stage where they can have their own firms and go overseas and grow food overseas for export back to Barbados. And so the Broca Ponda agreement, for example, with Suriname would be a classic way in which we would be able to address the, the items that we can't grow here, but we can go into larger land spaces and be able to do that and provide food for the country. And the third aspect of it then would be to look at diversifying for the imports that we absolutely need to bring in, diversifying the sources which we get them from. 
so that if there is for, for whatever reason or the drop in the marketplace um, for, for an item, we have another source that we can get the items from so that the disruption of the food supply is not significant or it can be very smooth so we avoid those disruptions. So there's really a, a three phase approach to uh, dealing with food security. There is self-reliance and, and maximizing and optimizing all that we can produce here and ensuring that the quality of what we're producing here is of the highest quality. The second aspect is going to be on expanding to grow overseas. And the third one is then going to be to diversify the imports or the sources of the imports which we need, uh, which we can't supply through those two other options. Ms. Holder, are you happy with the level of technology in the agriculture sector? You know, when it comes to technology, there are a number of farmers who've been doing, uh, pockets of farmers, I should say, who are doing some, some really good things. But um, in terms of the entire sector, there's a lot more that needs to get done. Uh, we are now in what is called the fourth um, agricultural revolution, which is framed by digital technology, um, every aspect of the agricultural chain, we can now uh, mechanize from planting to harvest. We now are using remote sensing technology, GPS technology to map farms, to determine soil fertility, to identify pests and disease issues. And these technologies are now coming down um, in terms of price and, uh, and accessibility so that small farmers, in, in, in the context of Barbados, all of our farmers would be considered small on the global scale so that our farmers, which are small farmers, would be able to access this technology. Now, what does this technology do? It allows us to be more precise. It allows us to optimize our production. It allows us to be more responsive to things like climate change, climate adaptation and mitigation strategies. So these are the things that we need now to move forward because that's where the future is going to be, where you're using uh, robotics, you're using more mechanized equipment, you're using big data analytics, we're using um, all aspects of um, remote sensing. These are This is a new world of agriculture. There's blockchain as well, where we can map everything from the farm right to the fork. And so all of these things are making the agricultural sector um, more robust in terms of being able to respond to climate change, but also being able to respond to the needs of the consumer. We're even going further than that in terms of the scientific analytics um, for particular products, looking at nutritional quality, even within varieties, being able to make recommendations between what is happening, uh, what, what particular crop is would have, or even a part particular variety could have what nutritional benefits according to the health and wellness needs of particular persons. So there's a huge amount of work being done in terms of science and technology and being able to produce high levels of, of food, high quality food, at reduced prices with more efficiency um, and also with more consistency and reliability. This is where we need to take the sector. Um, we are not there right now, but I think with the right set of um, policies and the right set of applications, we can start to move the sector rapidly to that place. Ms. Older, we really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for joining us. And we're joined now by the Minister of Agriculture and Food Security, the Honourable Indar Weir. Thank you, Minister, for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Lisa. Now, if we could just follow on from Ms. Holder and talk briefly on the ash situation. What is your ministry doing? Are you offering any level of assistance to farmers who might have lost some significant crops? Yeah, definitely. Um, we are doing a complete assessment of the situation. Uh, so I held uh, stakeholders meetings uh, on Saturday and Tuesday to get a feel for what is happening with the farmers. Uh, we have uh, the Barbados Agriculture Society, the BADMC, uh, and between the two of them, they cover most of the farmers across Barbados. And then all the independent ones who may not be members of an association or may not be covered by the BADMC, we send our extension officers to visit. So we would do a complete assessment of what has actually happened since the ash fall and then we will be able to put programs in place to assist the farmers based on what the needs are. So that needs assessment is entirely important in order for us to be able to go forward um, and suggest any um, recommendations to the cabinet of Barbados so that they can get some assistance if need be. What I do know is from the consultations that I had, 
um, livestock farming uh, will be the one that will be particularly challenged since um, you're dealing with ash fall and the toxicity that can impact the animal's digestive system and indeed can lead to mortality. So we are looking at how we can put measures in place to provide any assistance in the very, very short term. Uh, we have to do a total assessment of all of the hay that is available in Barbados. We're working on that right now with the uh, farmers and the associations. And then we are gonna make uh, a provision for, given the fact that we are in the sugar harvest, all of the cane tops as well that are available to make sure we can provide enough fodder for the livestock industry. Uh, that being the case, this will cover the dairy industry, small ruminants, and um, of course, we are trying to work an arrangement with the turf club as well for the horses. Uh, that being done, then we've asked all of the other um, livestock farmers, those in the pig industry, for example, or the poultry industry, to make sure they keep the feed covered, water covered, and that those animals are properly covered so that the ash does not impact them. And um, this afternoon, um, well, we will go back then and make sure we cover all of the areas that we flag and then um, come up with a solution. So it is not just as simple as say, um, do something. We have to do a complete needs assessment and then we will go forward and we are doing this in the very short term. You, met, you mentioned the sugar harvest. We are in the middle of the sugar crop. How is the crop going? It was going well. Um, but because of one, the ash fall, and then the factory at Portville is a fairly old factory as well. So from time to time, you get some downtime. Um, I think we were pretty much on track up to this week. And then uh, because of the ash fall, we had to grind to a halt on Saturday. Uh, we will resume shortly. Um, and then uh, I would say we would finish the crop about one week late. But everything else is on track in terms of our yields. Our yields are looking extremely good. We are projecting 110,000 ton, tons of cane, and we are pretty much on track to achieving that. No, 110,000 tons is a lot lower than many previous years. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the industry has gone through a tremendous amount of changes. A lot of people who were in sugarcane production are out of sugarcane production now. So the BAMC basically is doing a lot of heavy lifting to rebuild um, the industry to what we would like it to be, and that is at its optimum. Uh, we're never gonna get back to the glory days of sugar, uh, but we've made some significant changes. Uh, those changes include producing what is considered to be wet sugar. So we are looking at more molasses production so that we can help our rum industry, especially when they go towards a GI. Um, a lot of the inputs that would go into the rum industry should be Barbadian and therefore we are making sure we provide enough molasses to help supplement what they import and that they would have that Barbadian molasses as part of the inputs that are going into the, uh, the rum industry. And then we have changed our strategy as it relates to our crystal sugar. Mm -hmm. um, previously we exported that in bulk. Um, and many times you will see it come back to us as refined sugar at a lot higher price than what we would have exported it at. What we are doing now is we are allowing for domestic consumption. So a lot of the distributors in Barbados are now able to purchase our sugar previously. They weren't able to do so. And they can now supply the domestic market. And then we've also worked an arrangement to have export into the U.S. So um, we've form a two-prong attack in terms of how we would deal with the marketing of our sugar, the crystal sugar, and that is working well also. Uh, we have increased our earnings um, more than double in some instances from um, domestic consumption and direct sale of sugar uh, than we were doing when we were exporting in bulk. And what's been your feedback? Uh, extremely positive. Um, it's good to know that we can now have Barbados's sugar being retailed in our supermarkets and being retailed through the distribution system in Barbados. Um, the arrangement that was in, in place previously, pre prior to 2018, was that there was a sole supplier um, who was supplying Barbados' sugar to one entity in Barbados. We have changed that now, and um, more supermarkets can have access to Barbados' sugar, 
and the distributors in Barbados now are able to purchase directly from Portville so that we are now even in the playing field and making sure that everybody's on a level playing field. No, agriculture over the years took a back seat to other sectors, but agriculture was one of the few sectors that was a bright spark last year for during COVID. I'm, I'm sure that pleases you as minister. Well, it does indeed. And, and I give credit to the staff at the ministry uh, for the hard work they've been doing and working with me because I, I must confess that we have to push and push very hard. And we work hours sometimes that people are not usually accustomed to, um, but also to the farmers and the stakeholders in the sector as well, who have been very, very cooperative. Um, when we ask to have production, uh, we usually get all of our stakeholders together. Uh, we discuss how we're going to approach it. We look at what assistance will be needed and they all cooperate very well. And so we were fortunate to be able to see a 1.9% growth in the sector when all other sectors were down. And this is attributed directly to strategic planning uh, during the COVID uh, period. The food import bill, just over $700 million, still remains exceedingly high. What is your ministry doing to combat this? Good question, Lisa. Um, and this is something that has been de debated oftentimes in public. Years. Uh, for years. Uh, the reality of it is that the food import bill does not necessarily cover only primary agricultural produce. And that's the first thing that I try to explain whenever I'm addressing this. Uh, it covers a lot of things like wines and coffee and a lot of processed goods that we will not be able to do in Barbados at this point in time. Um, but primary agriculture is way, way, way below, uh, probably just over 200 million. Um, and uh, primary agriculture goods that are imported are things like broccoli. Broccoli takes a high, high, high chunk of our food import bill. And so does white potatoes or what people refer to as English mm -hmm. potatoes. What are we doing to address this? We've already started some trials with broccoli. And those trials have proven to be fairly successful. So we are now going to expand those trials across other plantations and other farms to make sure that we actually get it right. Uh, broccoli is a very temperate um, crop, and therefore we have to make sure we find the right varieties in order to be able to do a successful uh, broccoli crop. Uh, that is being worked on. It is going well. The other thing is white potatoes. What we are seeking to do is help Barbadians to understand the importance of eating healthy, and therefore we are promoting sweet potatoes as an option. Uh, I don't think that we need to follow and grow uh, white potatoes on large, large scale when we have sweet potatoes already. But what we have to do is transition Barbadians into eating healthy and also transition Barbadians into supporting local produce. Uh, so that if you look at your fast food restaurants, for example, rather than get uh, white potato chips, you can get sweet potato chips. Then all of a sudden we are making a change. And then if our restaurants and all the others follow suit, all of a sudden then you can see that we can start to change this narrative and the food import bill uh, by, extent, by extension of us changing our habits and our lifestyle will also come down. How big was a hit for the sector when tourism also took a hit? Because we had hotels shut, restaurants shut, and then we had a glut, especially of poultry. Good question. Um, reality of it is that our poultry industry is perhaps the most successful uh, plank within the agriculture sector. Um, and, and it works very well, so that the industry was producing based on projected tourism numbers. And when we took the hit with COVID, uh, there became a sudden drop in demand for poultry produce generally. Uh, and therefore, we had um, excess supply of chicken. So we had to do a number of things in order to, co to correct that. One was that we had to look for storage. Uh, storage comes at an additional cost, obviously. And the other thing we had to do is do some PR as well, because Barbadians generally like a fresh chicken. Yes. And so we then had to explain how you can still use a frozen chicken and it's still the same chicken. And obviously then we had to remove some of the competition from the market space. So uh, the BADMC uh, would have had a supply of chicken wings uh, in their barn, and we thought that we can put a hole on that so that we can get rid of the local produce. And, and this needs some explanation because 
what happens is that in the poultry industry, you'll find that you have a lot of poultry growers in Barbados who will have like 200 chickens in the backyard, some 150. But it's a way of getting either an income or supplementing an income because many times Barbadians don't have high disposable incomes and therefore they look at options. And this is one of the options that they would pursue. Uh, we then determined that in order for us to help those very small ones avoid the additional cost or even go to wastage because many of them will not be able to pay for storage, uh, we removed the sale of that competing poultry product, which was chicken wings, for a two month period as the target. It didn't last for as long as two months. I think it went for as long as only six weeks. But the truth is it made a significant difference to the industry. Uh, we had excess supply of eggs as well, and we had to find ways to have, get those moving, but eggs you can store easier than you can store actual chicken. Now, you mentioned it about competition, even though we're fairly self-sufficient when it comes to poultry. How, how do you intend to address that, or can you address it? Yeah, again, um, it takes will on the part of the people of Barbados. And I've said over and over that um, what it is that we're doing um, when we import poultry. Um, if it is for processing, fine, uh, but we equally have to make sure that the processors are prepared to work with our poultry producers as well and not just use um, excuses to bring in poultry. And this is something that we have flagged and we are going to make sure that if our local poultry producers can do it, then that we will use local poultry. But then the other big one is how we then deal with the fact that Barbadians have a huge appetite for chicken wings. And um, our poultry industry will not be able to produce all the chicken wings that we will want to consume. But it's also very unhealthy. And if we are going to make sure that we change lifestyles in Barbados, reduce our, the cost of health care in Barbados, then we have to get everybody on board. And getting everybody on board will simply mean that we can transition to using other parts of the chicken. And so when you see the chicken tenders come out, lots of people block the roads in lines trying to get through drive throughs So this is an option, but um, we have to talk people through it. We have to get people on board. And until we get there, uh, I guess we will have to deal with how the competition is gonna work, how it's gonna impact the industry. Once tourism comes back, and then with the opportunity for home porting, I am confident that the poultry industry will continue to do well. Let's look at the issue of pork production. How's pork faring? Yes, uh, pork production in Barbados is faring well. Um, last year, uh, they had a slight growth, uh, nothing to really write home about, but a growth is a growth anyway. Uh, and uh, the pork producers in Barbados are comfortable at this point in time. Uh, when we have our stakeholders meetings, I make sure that they flag for me what the challenges are. Uh, we have had a huge challenge with cuts of pork that uh, you don't normally get here in Barbados. And then that is combined with people who have a propensity for eating a lot of ribs. So uh, you'll find that those people who have special permission either to import because they're manufacturers or to import specialty cuts, then you get a whole a lot of other parts of um, pork coming in as well. It's going to take a lot of managing. Um, we have been working with the Ministry of Commerce and we, are, we will continue to work with them to make sure that we look at what is coming in. I've had a meeting with the customs, uh, the, the control of customs as well. And we're going to look at how we can deal with those products that are coming in that will not necessarily need to be here uh, once we take full control of the situation. A few years ago, Barbados imported dozens of bulls and heifers to help stimulate the dairy industry. Has that paid off? Yes, um, it did, uh, because if we didn't do that, then our milk production will be substantially less. Um, the dairy industry is having its challenges. Uh, one of is water. Um, you know that a large portion of milk production involves a high volumes of water. If the animals don't get access to high volumes of potable water, then of course the milk production will be down. Uh, but equally then we have a problem with how we can expand the industry so that um, dairy farmers can have um, 
an opportunity to lower their operating costs um, and then provide them with the enough fodder that they would need. So there are a fair amount of dynamics within the industry. Equally, we have to increase um, the, the number of animals we have in Barbados in order for us to maintain a sustainable industry. And that is the reason why we went to importing the heifers. Now, you mentioned water being a challenge for some in the dairy industry as well. It's also an issue for those um, with crops. What is your ministry doing to help address that? Uh, good one. Um, the, the dairy farmers, uh, we have started to work with them. We have to look at a number of things mm -hmm. in order to be able to address that because they must use potable water. And that then becomes a question of how we work with the Barbados Water Authority and how we then look at the additional cost that has been added, uh, which is the GST uh, to the water bills. That is being worked on. Um, Ambassador Dr. Clyde Maskell is working with us and coming up with a solution for that. Um, I can't disclose it at this point in time, but I will say to you that there's a possible solution in place. And then for the crop farmers, uh, we are looking at a water augmentation program. We're starting off at River in St. Philip, where we are going to have 6 million gallons of water in what is known as Bronx Pond. And then the tree houses spring. We're also going to be putting in uh, Seuss gates so that we control the flow of water and make sure that the farmers downstream are getting access to water uh, right across the entire river plantation. And then at the, uh, at the um, river plantation house, there is a dam there that we are also going to expand. Then we will go to Spring Hall Land Lease Project. We are doing already a program to clean all the wells, the salt wells that Spring Hall Land Lease Project. And we will also move then to put in an expanded irrigation system and also a, a dam at Spring Hall to make sure that we can provide consistency and supply of water for the farmers at both River and at Spring Hall. It's significant to note that river by dint of its name is prone to extreme flooding when we get heavy rain. So this one has been prioritized because we have to make sure that when we come to the next rainy season, we have the dams in place. Uh, we had targeted the end of June, but given all the shutdown and what is taking place now, we may very well end up finishing somewhere around the first, second week of August. And we have that projected as our finishing date so that we can take advantage of the rainy season. Now, we always hear about arable lands being taken out of agriculture for residential or commercial purposes. But we have hundreds of acres of Clico lands lying idle. What's happening with, with that? Uh, we've started a process and we are working with the team at Res Life uh, to make sure that we come up with what is considered a suitable fit for uh, Clico lands. Uh, we can't get away from the fact that Clico lands basically are managed by Res Life. They don't fall under the Ministry of Agriculture. But BAMC has been able to do an arrangement to get Wakefield back into the production. So Wakefield now is a center for agricultural excellence. Uh, we have a nursery there to increase our sugarcane production with treated sugarcane. Um, sugar Canes over the years have been suffering with ratum stunted disease, and a lot of the canes were not growing to full potential. Um, at we feel we are providing clean planting material for our farmers so that we can increase yields and get back sugar to what I mentioned earlier, up to an optimum level where we can then produce enough molasses and enough crystal sugar. Um, Wakefield, if, if uh, you were to see Wakefield, is a complete transformation. So, uh, and it also has um, on the other side of the plantation, the option for us to bring in small farmers. And we've expanded the feed program now to include small farmers at Wakefield. And then we are moving that expansion process into what is called Project Care, where uh, we will be uh, facilitating farmers, not only on small plots of land like at Wakefield, but within communities as well. There's also another option on the table for BAMC to look at additional Clico lands, but that is still at negotiation stages. And um, once it is completed, then um, we will be able to bring those into production just as fast. You just touched on 
the feed program and project care briefly. Let's start first with the feed program. Tell us how that program is, go is going, despite the challenges. Uh, well, it, it has had a lot of challenges. Um, COVID is not the only one, I must confess. Um, there were several other dynamics that you know we had to fix. For example, lack of water, um, and then quick accessibility to land. Um, the reality of it is that we have had over a thousand farmers. Our target is 2,000 and within 2,000 over three years. Now, if you had to remove 2020 because of the period of shutdown, etc., I would say that uh, we are still on track, um, but this is now going to run us beyond three years. The reality of it is that we have farmers now waiting to be trained. Um, we also have farmers who are going to graduate from cohort two, just over 200 of them. And we are providing them with all the inputs, that is access to land, water, um, all of the seedlings, PPE, um, and fertilizers, and then extension services because they still have to continue to get the technical support as well. And then uh, we will go into training of the third cohort. So that is going according to plan within recent times. And I'm hoping that we can then move the Farmers Empowerment and Franchisement Drive feed program to another level where under project here, we're going to provide 129 acres of land through the BAMC at Constant and at, um, Constant Wakefield and north of the island, Chance Hall and Chance Hall is one, and I believe Bordens is another one. Uh, what we are going to do there is to bring in additional farmers, uh, people who are currently unemployed, um, don't have other options, but can quickly get into farming doing what we call cash crops or short-term crops, lettuce, tomatoes, um, beans, those kind of things. Um, and we're also going to give them a chance to receive the cultivation services just like we are doing under the current feed program. Cultivation services mean going the full distance in terms of preparing the land and then providing them with all the inputs so that they can get started as well and looking at how we can provide them with water, either by way of an irrigation system or through tankers. Uh, when that is done, this is an additional 129 acres of land that will be brought into production. But Project Care does not stop there. Uh, the ministry has been receiving several calls from people uh, who have been asking for assistance with cultivation within their communities. So you'll find that these are people who are like guys who are on the block, not employed, looking for an opportunity, want to do some agriculture, but can't get assistance with cultivation and do not have the financial resources so to do. And what we've done is we've created this project, Project Care, which basically is a dovetail of care packages. Uh, what was happening is that the government was providing the care packages with all the agricultural produce. And when we looked at it, we said, well, this is something that we should continue, but give people the opportunity now to go back to their kitchen gardens with assistance from government. Give people the opportunity then to come off the block and get an opportunity to participate in agriculture within their communities. And when I went around and looked at the communities, there's tremendous potential in terms of empowering people to get back to community farming. We're gonna give them all the implements so they will get the pancarts, et cetera. We're gonna give them the whackers, all the implements that they need. And then we will give them the extension services so that they are guided through the process of planting. And we will also provide them with the seedlings and the PPE. Under this program, uh, we're going right across Barbados to those communities that um, would need that assistance. And why we are doing this? One, it gives us an opportunity to also empower and enfranchise more people in Barbados, but also it gives us an opportunity to allow those people who would not have been able to get some form of income to get income. And then many of them will be people, when I check, who would not ordinarily be able to have a meal that is well balanced. And so with them growing their own produce, that we will correct. But equally then, there are several people who would otherwise be drawn to things like pretty larceny, for example. And um, to, in order for us to avoid that, you give them 
the opportunity to grow their own produce, which they can sell. And that is the reason why we've gone with Project Care. If this is extended across all the communities of Barbados, that especially in urban Barbados, then all of a sudden you have an opportunity to then build on the feed program and at the same time give more people an opportunity for enfranchisement. And that project we are definitely going to be rolling out. Uh, we are currently working with the Rastos at Bath. Uh, they are there. We are providing assistance to them. And we are now looking at a solution for water at Bath so that we can keep them going. Bath is a total of about 80 acres of land. Um, so far, we have allocated 40 acres to two Rastafarian groups. And we are looking now at the allocation of an additional 40 so that when we are finished, the Rastafarian community of Barbados will be predominantly at Bath, and we are going to make sure that we restore the old factory chimney there and put a facility in place for vending as well, so that Barbadians can go to Bath to purchase their produce, but at the same time take advantage of these uh, what they call natural juices and uh, idle food that will be available for sale as well. You mentioned a balanced meal. There's still concern that the cost of some vegetables, produce is way too high. And I know that we hear reports about price gouging across the sector. Uh, it's a difficult one. Um, generally, the cost of production in Barbados is high. And therefore, how do you address that? Uh, out of pure economics, when you increase the volume and you increase production, then automatically it drives prices down. Um, so if we're going to increase production, then that can address the issue of even price gouging. So let's assume that that is there. Once there's increased production, people have greater access, then competition then determines the price. Um, the greater the supply, um, obviously the price will come down. I'm glad you mentioned increasing production. What's happening with the deal with Suriname? Um, that has been ongoing. We unfortunately weren't able to move the farmers because just as we were about to do that, we had the outbreak of COVID and all travel was suspended. Uh, I held a meeting with the new Minister of Agriculture and we are prepared to get back to it. But then we had a second wave of COVID and that also slowed us down. But that's definitely on the table. We're definitely going to go after that because there are tremendous opportunities as well. We do not have the scale in Barbados like they would have in Suriname. We certainly don't have access to the water like they do. So this is definitely a go as far as we are concerned. Let's look now at cotton. We always hear the ads for needing people to come and pick cotton. What's happening with the cotton harvest? Uh, we have seen some improvement. The industry itself, um, cotton had just taken a dip. Um, a lot of things weren't working out. We had several problems with insect infested infestation. And then um, our acreage, uh, we didn't have enough acres in production. Uh, what we've done, we've looked at how we can arrive at an optimum um, amount to produce. And that target basically is going to be somewhere around a thousand acres to start. Uh, so what we've determined is that in order for us to do this and do this successfully, uh, we are putting back 300 acres into production. Watch how that goes. And then once we can tweak um, any problems that we would have had, then we would start increasing exponentially. Um, we are currently doing 300 acres. Uh, the yields are looking good. Uh, the, the crops are growing very well. Um, now we've just got this ash fall, and that is a setback because the ash fall can definitely damage the quality of the cotton. Um, but we are working on it. The, the um, BAMC and the ministry are both collaborating and making sure we get our increased production of cotton as well. And at Wakefield, we do have a beautiful cotton field. Now, many are keeping a close eye on the rollout of the medicinal marijuana industry. I understand that we have interests as far away as Russia. How is that going? Extremely good uh, in terms of interest. Um, the industry uh, is an industry that has its dynamics. Uh, the COVID situation, for example, had slowed down the industry. We launched on January 18th, and as soon as we launched, we had 
a tremendous amount of interest in terms of applications for licenses. But it doesn't just stop there because people, first of all, will carry out the investigation. Uh, people want to know about the licensing process. They want to know about costs. They want to know uh, a lot more about Barbados. And therefore, you know, we had to set up then uh, office within the medicinal cannabis licensing authority to be able to handle queries. And uh, we have had just over 58 queries for licenses. Um, we have had about two applications because I don't want this to be confused with licenses. Uh, applications, that is people who have already applied. And then we have uh, well over 30 applications that may well come through, but they are what we call draft stage. Draft stage means that we are still going through the process with the applicants. Uh, many other jurisdictions take as long as 18 months to two years to be able to list, issue a license by the huge amount of due diligence that you have to do. We have flagged four months for Barbados uh, because we believe that we really have to be nimble if we are then going to catch up with where the industry is at at this point in time. And the due diligence process is, is our highest priority at this point in time. So the applications that we have before us, once people come through, they pay the application fee, uh, then we start the process and we will come back within a four months period to determine if they will get a license or not. And there's concern that the average man might not be able to get a license. Yeah, that's a conversation that has been badly misunderstood. And it's a, it's a narrative that um, is being carried in the wrong direction. Um, what we did when we passed the legislation, we said, look, every Barbadian must have an opportunity to participate if he or she so desires. And so that if there's any foreign investment coming to the medicinal cannabis industry, 30% must go to local ownership. So Barbadians can have 30% of any international investment because that is what is required by law. Equally, we have said any Barbadian business or any Barbadian individual who wants to participate in this industry can have 100% ownership so that you do not have to share with anyone. Therefore, first of all, that gives Barbadians a chance to be owners in two ways. One, through um, the 30% that is made available for foreign investment and two, 100% local ownership. We've also gone further than that, and we have determined that through the feed program, we're gonna look at some of those farmers who are considered small farmers to provide them with assistance in terms of licensing, provide them with training, and provide them with an opportunity to determine if they want to be cultivators or if they want to get into processing as well. Uh, the BMCLA will work with them, and we are looking now uh, how we would determine the funding in order to get them there. What is it really that people are referring to? It is not really that Barbadians will not get a chance. They're referring to how would I find the financial resources to be able to do this. And the BMC Elliot and I are now looking at establishing a Barbadian company through the BMC Elliot that would be set up, owned by government, but then include all of those interested persons through either associations or co-ops to give them the opportunity to participate. They will get the licensing throughout the value chain. So it would be cultivator processing, um, health and wellness spa, and they would get an opportunity now through the entire value chain. And the government would transition them into ownership over a three to five years period with then them becoming the owners and the government removing itself from that space. This is a conversation that we have already started at the BMCLA. Um, clearly, I can't go into all the details of it because this is something that I also have to take before the cabinet. But suffice it to say that we are looking at ways now to address this concern and to make sure that we hear the people of Barbados and do what is right by them. What area is your biggest concern now in the agriculture sector? Uh, there are several things. Um, the sector itself does not have the kind of scale um, that we would need in order for us to address what you mentioned earlier in terms of food import. 
we have to get there, um, but we have to build a foundation. I repeat this all the time. In order for us to build that foundation, we, had to, we have to deal with a number of things. One, we have to make sure we have consistency in supply of water. Barbados is uh, a country that goes through prolonged droughts and therefore consistency in supply of water is one. Uh, we have to deal with issues of getting farmers not only just to plant, but to plant for a reason. So that if I'm planting, for example, cucumbers, I know that if I have 10 acres of cucumbers when they're ready for harvest, I know where they're going. Those things we now have to work out. I mean, this, is a, this agricultural sector has been ongoing for decades, but these things weren't really flagged. And we now have to flag them and work on them. Um, Agro-processing is also another area that we have to look at carefully, especially as it relates to crop production. Um, the, the BADMC has a fat house, but we also now have to go further in increasing the scale of the fat house and at the same time putting in place opportunities now for Barbadians to get involved in agro-processing. And it doesn't necessarily have to be agro-processing at a scale where you need a huge plant. Because if we get into things like packaging and things like blast freezing, then this creates an opportunity for other Barbadians to own a business doing these things. And then we also have our cottage industry. So that if you get people now who within the cottage industry are coming under an umbrella similar to what is done internationally, Grace Kennedy is one that comes to mind immediately. Uh, you have people then who can do other things. And if we can get people into um, processing and packaging because you don't have to necessarily go the route of putting everything in a can. Um, I personally purchase fresh fruit frozen to do my smoothies. And these are options that could be available in terms of crops grown in Barbados. And the Chief Agriculture Officer and I have been discussing this. And we're looking at how we can move people now into agro-processing even within the cottage industry. So despite COVID, despite the situation with the ash, from where you sit, the future for agriculture remains bright. Um, the future for agriculture can be bright. Uh, we have to overcome some of the challenges that confront us, but we got this. And uh, we are gonna continue to work on it. We understand what is required of us. Uh, it is not gonna be a short-term solution. I can tell you that up front. Um, but once we continue to work, what is it we're going to do? We're going to fix those things that we already are in control of. Pork in, poultry industry, pork industry. Uh, we're going to pick the ones that are already working and move them to the next level. And then the ones that will need some time to be worked on, we're working on those. And that is the reason why we're working so closely with our farmers. That's the reason why we have the feed program. And that's the reason why the ministry is the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security, because we're going to make sure that this country is food secure but it takes will on the part of people to also change their lifestyles. Thank you so much, Minister, as always, for joining us. That was the Minister of Agriculture and Food Security, the Honorable Indar Ware, and I'm Lisa Lord. Thanks for watching One on One. <music>